20th, 1980, significant volcanic activity began to occur all over Mount St. Helens in Washington State. The north face of the mountain had begun to visibly shake, and then by March 27th, there was steam coming out of the craters and vents all over the north side of the mountain. That April, scientists began to notice that there was this massive bulge that was growing on the north side of this mountain that was about a mile in diameter, and every day it was growing about six feet farther and farther up the mountain, and it was basically this massive undercurrent of magma that was going towards the top of the mountain getting ready to explode. Initially, there was some speculation that perhaps this magma bulge is not nearly as big of a deal as people are making it out to be, that really, at worst, it could be a small eruption and it would have no impact on the surrounding areas. But authorities became skittish and were worried that they could just be caught with their pants down if this turned into a full-blown volcanic eruption. So they began evacuating the area. And for the most part, everybody evacuated with the exception of a few scientists and some photographers and some really hardcore people that did not want to leave their homes. One of those people who had stayed behind was Robert Landsberg, who was a photographer, and on May 18th, 1980, he was out hiking about seven miles away from the summit of Mount St. Helens, and he was making his way up to try to find a good viewpoint of that north face. He wanted to look at that magma surge that was making its way up on the north side of the mountain. And so finally, he makes his way up, and he gets to a great spot, and he starts taking pictures of that north face. While Robert is taking pictures of that side of the mountain, a 5.2 magnitude earthquake struck the area, causing that entire north face of Mount St. Helens to be sheared off and begin falling down the side of the mountain. It's this massive landslide. It's one of the biggest that's ever been recorded in that area. But what it really did is all of a sudden that entire magma surge that had been building up underneath on the north side making its way up suddenly is uncovered and it causes this massive volcanic explosion shooting 15 miles straight up into the air. Along with this massive vertical blast, there was a simultaneous lateral blast basically pointed directly at Robert. And it sent these molten debris surging down the mountainside at 100 miles an hour or faster. Robert knew he had no hope of escaping this wall of magma and ash coming straight at him. So he decides, instead of trying to save myself, I'm gonna take as many pictures as I can of this volcanic eruption, and then I'm gonna to try to protect the film. And so Robert took as many pictures as he could of this massive volcanic wall of death coming towards him until the very last second when he puts his camera into his bag, he puts that into his backpack, and then he holds it against his chest and lays down on the ground using his body as the last protective measure to try to save this film for posterity. 17 days later, they find Robert Landsberg's body, and sure enough, he was able to protect his film by laying on top of it. And so they developed the pictures that he took, and they're incredible. Here are the final pictures that Robert Landsberg took before he was killed by the volcano. On September 21st, 2014, Darsh Patel, who was a 22-year-old college student, was out hiking in a New Jersey state park along with five of his college buddies. As they were about to head down a particular trail that they had actually gone to this park to go down, a man and woman come charging up the path towards them. And so Darsh and his friends stop and they're looking at these two people who look totally distraught and scared. And the man and woman immediately say, hey, don't go down this path. We were just down there and for the past 10 minutes, a black bear has been stalking us in the tree line. We, we don't know where it went, but we got up here, we turned around and it was gone, but we would not suggest going down this path. It's just not worth it. Darsh and his friends tell the couple, you know, thank you for giving us the heads up. We were actually gonna go down that path. And so I guess now we won't. And so the couple, they quickly leave and Darsh and his friends are sitting there thinking, well, now what do we do? Because this was the trail we were gonna go down. This is why we're here. As they're standing there, they start talking about, well, Maybe we just go down anyways. You know, there's there's six of us. I, I highly doubt that a bear is gonna come out of the woods and attack six people, especially a black bear that is not known to attack people. Why don't we just walk down a ways and if we see the bear, then we just turn around and leave. And if we see the bear, might make some good pictures. Let's just go down there and, and see what happens. And they start walking. And sure enough, about 10 minutes into their trip down this trail, they see this massive bear parked right in the center of the trail about 250 meters away from where they were. The bear did not appear to be doing anything. It was just sitting there, but it was clearly looking at the group of them. So Darsh and his friends are just standing there, not really sure what to do. So they start taking pictures and videos. They're not moving any closer, but they just start documenting what they're seeing because this bear was apparently stalking this couple. It was pretty interesting. And they figured, hey, make some good pictures. So they start taking pictures and taking some videos of this animal and the animal starts walking towards them. 
Now it's 250 meters away. They recognize that this is a dangerous animal and we don't want to get too close to it, but they felt relatively safe. Even if it started moving towards them initially, they still felt safe. But the animal starts jogging towards them. At this point, the boys put their phones away, turn around, and they start hightailing it the other way. And somebody looks back and notices the bear is now sprinting at them. This causes the group to completely panic. They start sprinting back towards where their cars were parked. Absolute full panic back up the trail. No one's paying attention to anybody else. They're just running for their lives. And as they're turning their heads to look, the bear is gaining on them and gaining on them. Finally, after about 10 minutes of just running for their lives, they make it to the parking lot and they turn around. There's no bear, but they're short one hiker. Darsh Patel is still in the forest somewhere. The group starts screaming for Darsh. They know there was this aggressive bear in there chasing them, so they're obviously worried about him potentially getting attacked. And so they immediately call 911. The police show up and park rangers show up and they go into the forest to try to find this bear and to find Darsh. And very quickly they come across this bear in a clearing, this 300 pound bear all by itself, aggressively pacing around this lump in the middle of this clearing that had sticks and branches on it. It wasn't clear what it was. And this bear is just pacing in a circle around this thing. And as these two park rangers get closer, they're armed. The bear looks at them and makes a move like it's gonna charge and they elect to shoot and kill this bear. Later, the bear's remains would be taken to a laboratory and inside of the bear's stomach was Darsh Patel. He had been killed and eaten by this bear. And that lump that was on the ground that the bear was circling was whatever was left of Darsh that had not been consumed yet. When they recovered Darsh Patel's phone, they went into his images and they found he had taken one final picture before he was attacked. Here it is. The bear was not malnourished, it was not diseased, it just decided it wanted to stalk, kill, and eat a human. Vladimir Komarov was a Soviet astronaut who in 1967 was scheduled to orbit the Earth in the first manned flight of a particular Soviet spacecraft called the Soyuz. Komarov would be flying this mission solo, and so he needed a backup in case for some reason he couldn't go. And his backup was Yuri Gagarin, who was actually Komarov's best friend. This mission was very important to the Soviet Union, more from a political standpoint, but nonetheless, the pressure was on Komarov to successfully complete this mission. And so he, along with his backup, Yuri, had to train extra hard and make sure they did not screw this up. But it turns out the fail point for this mission was almost certainly not going to be Komarov or Gagarin if he ended up going instead of Komarov. It was going to be the spaceship itself. Gagarin, along with a host of engineers, did a full-blown inspection of the Soyuz and found 203 significant structural problems, and they all recommended postponement of this mission. But their recommendation was ignored because, again, this mission was so politically important to the Soviet Union that they were effectively ready to risk their astronauts to make it happen. When Komarov found out about all these structural issues and the fact that the powers that be were not even listening and were basically saying, we don't care, you're doing this mission anyways. He was crushed and he told a KGB agent that he was certain he was going to die. And this KGB agent would later say that he asked Komarov, well then why don't you refuse the mission? And Komarov said, if I refuse the mission, they're going to make my best friend go and he'll die up there. So I have to go. Gagarin pleaded with Komarov to relinquish the role, let Gagarin go instead of him. But Komarov was staunch. He said, I've been given this mission. I'm going to go. You're going to stay here. But what Komarov did, which is so legendary, is he made sure his funeral, if he were to die in the course of this mission, would be open casket. Because he knew if he came back to Earth, it was probably going to be because this spaceship has crashed and he wanted the Soviet leadership to see what they had done. So sure enough, Komarov gets in the Soyuz on launch day, he takes off, and the problems began almost immediately. They had very little power, they had limited communications with the ground, and the craft itself was spinning uncontrollably. Seeing how badly it was going already, Soviet leadership on the ground instructed Komarov to nix the mission and just try to come back to Earth. For five hours, Komarov circled Earth and attempted to re-enter Earth's atmosphere, but his ship, because of all of those structural problems, didn't work. And so 18 times he attempts to re-enter Earth's atmosphere, but each time it fails. And it was around this time that American intelligence recorded a conversation between a high-ranking Soviet leader on the ground and Komarov. 
and the leader on the ground is basically crying and saying they're so sorry to Komarov and that he's going to be a hero. They got his wife to come on and his wife is talking to Komarov and Komarov's telling her, you know, what to do with the kids, what to do with his estate. He's perfectly fine and healthy, but the craft is doomed and everybody knows it. Then that call ends and Komarov on his 19th attempt is able to re-enter Earth's atmosphere, which everyone was pretty surprised he could even do that, but his parachutes failed. As Komarov is plunging to his death, over the radio he's cursing the Soviet leadership that doomed him by putting him in a botched spaceship. And so sure enough, on April 24th, around 7 a.m., Komarov's craft smashes into the ground, killing Komarov, and when they open it up, it's clear what happened to him. He didn't die on impact. He basically burned alive inside of this capsule as it was careening down towards the Earth. And so all that's left of him is this charred pile. But because Komarov explicitly stated that they had to have an open casket funeral, specifically because he wanted the Soviet leadership to see what they had done to him, they had to hold an open casket funeral with just these charred remains. And here is the famous picture of Komarov's funeral, where the actual Soviet leaders that put him in that spaceship that was doomed. Here they are viewing his open casket funeral. So that's gonna do it guys. Let me know in the comments what you thought of these three stories and I will get back to all the early comments. If you take a trip to Hawaii, there's a good chance you'll visit the beautiful Rainbow Falls on the eastern side of the Big Island. But if you travel less than a mile upstream of those falls, you'll find an equally beautiful attraction that far less people know about, and it's called the Boiling Pots. 10,000 years ago, after a volcanic eruption, lava was flowing down the side of the mountain when it entered the Wailuku River. As the lava gradually cooled, the river water flowing all around it wound up carving out these standalone pools of water that were connected by a series of small waterfalls. These pools collectively make up the boiling pots, and they get their name because periodically the water in these pools appears to be boiling. Tourists at the boiling pots are allowed to look at the water from a safe distance on the cement overlook, but under no circumstances are allowed to actually enter the water. In 2015, Jolie Ricewig was a 62-year-old woman living in Kona, Hawaii, which is on the western side of the island. There, she owned a bed and breakfast, whose main allure was that guests at this bed and breakfast got to go on these fun adventure tours with Jolie all over the island, and they almost always involved paddleboarding or swimming, because Jolie was an avid outdoors person and a very talented swimmer and swim instructor, and so felt comfortable leading these types of excursions. On September 14th of that year, Jolie brought one of her male guests from her bed and breakfast out for an adventure tour at the Boiling Pots. She would have known that it was an off-limits area for swimmers because there were signs up everywhere saying as much, but Jolie wasn't planning to swim in the Boiling Pots. Instead, she was planning to float on them on inflatable rafts. And so she and this man climbed aboard their respective rafts and began paddling around one of the upper pools, taking in the incredible view of this natural phenomenon. As they were relaxing, suddenly there was this rush of water that came tumbling over the fall that dumped down into the pool they were in. It was a flash flood. And before Jolie and this man could swim outside of the pool and get to safety, the water under them began to churn violently and actually thrust them over the edge down into the next pool. And as soon as they hit the water, they had fallen off of their raft. So now they're swimming in the water and they're feeling a current pulling them down and pulling them forward towards the next lip into the next pool. And so they both began desperately swimming towards the edge. Jolie actually grabbed the man and helped push him up and out to safety. And as soon as he was on land, he turned around to grab her, but she wasn't there. And so he's looking around and all he can see is her raft floating on the surface being taken down into the rapids. And so he thinks, okay, she must have fallen into the next pool. And so on the side of the waterway, he runs down and he's looking into the next pool, the next pool, the next pool, and she's nowhere to be found. And after a few minutes of looking and not knowing where she was, he called the authorities. They came out and they launched this huge search for her, but despite searching the entirety of the boiling pots and all the way downstream, there was no sign of her. And after looking for an entire week, they never found anything. It was like she just disappeared, and so they turned the search off. As devastating as this was for the family to not have closure about what happened to Jolie, this was not a surprising outcome. In fact, it was almost an expected outcome considering why the boiling pots are off limits to swimmers. Each of the pools of water that make up the boiling pots is a deep, nearly vertical shaft of water, and at the bottom of it are these entrances to these underground tunnels, and these entrances are big enough for a person to slip inside of. And these tunnels are not short. 
they go on for a long ways in all different directions. In a flash flood scenario, that increased water that's flowing down the boiling pots creates this unbelievable current that inside of each of these pools is pulling straight down, which gives the water the impression that it's boiling, because basically the water's tumbling over as it's being filtered up and down inside of this vertical shaft. And so if you get grabbed by this current, it's going to pull you down and into one of these tunnels, and you won't get out again unless the current releases you. And so Jolie, after helping her guest get out of the water to safety, she was pulled down and into one of these tunnels, and she was held there for five months until finally the current released her, and her remains were spotted just below the pots in a tide pool. Our next story is called Out on a Limb. On the evening of March 25th, 2017, a 25-year-old farmer named Akbar Solibiro was harvesting palm fruit at the local oil palm grove near his tiny village in Indonesia. Now, the way Akbar would do this is he would use this long curved pole and he would prod at the bright red fruit in the tree, knocking it to the ground, and then he would gather it up, put it in his cart, and wheel it back home to be sold for palm oil. Now, on this night, Akbar was actually working later than usual because his wife and kids were out of town for a couple of days visiting family, and so there was no real reason to head back home because the house was empty. But Akbar was actually just fine with that because there was tons of ripe fruit, and so staying late would be quite profitable. But after a while, when the sun had finally set and it was getting difficult to actually even see the fruit in the tree... Akbar knew he really needed to leave soon, because this area at night was actually not safe. And so Akbar gathered up the remainder of his fruit on the ground, he put his pole in the cart as well, and he began quickly making his way back home. Later that evening, one of Akbar's neighbors was asleep in their bed inside of their home when they woke up suddenly to the sound of something out in the jungle, not far from where Akbar had been harvesting palm fruit. And so this neighbor, when they sat up, they couldn't really tell what the sound was. It almost sounded like a stifled scream or maybe some animal that was fighting with another animal. But as the neighbor sat there straining their ears to try to hear it again, they didn't. All they heard was normal sounds coming from the outside. And so the neighbor decided that the sound they heard must have been a cat or maybe a monkey. And, you know, whatever it was, it couldn't have been a big deal. And so this neighbor went back to sleep. The following evening, so 24 hours later, another one of Akbar's neighbors walked outside of their home to begin the walk over to the jungle to harvest palm fruit. And when they went outside, normally around this time, Akbar would be coming outside as well, because these two often went to the grove together. But, you know, this neighbor is looking and Akbar's not outside, and he looks up at Akbar's house and it's dark and quiet. And so this neighbor's thinking to themselves, you know, where is Akbar? You know, I know he worked late last night. I didn't hear him come in. And come to think of it, you know, I haven't seen him all day. And now, of course, I'm not seeing him as well. And so this neighbor, feeling concerned about Akbar, walked over and knocked on his door, but nobody answered. And so really starting to think that something could be wrong with Akbar, this neighbor went to Akbar's uncle's house. And when Akbar's uncle came to the door, this neighbor explained what was going on and their concern that, you know, something could have happened to Akbar. And so the uncle and this neighbor would go back over to Akbar's home and they would actually try the door. It was locked. They looked inside the windows and it looked like no one was in there. And they also noticed that where Akbar typically kept his cart that he would transport his fruit in, it wasn't there either, which made them think, you know, Akbar must still be out somewhere with this cart because this cart is very important to him. And so ultimately, the uncle, after seeing the state of his nephew's home, he agreed with this neighbor that, you know, something was wrong here. And if they wanted to find Akbar, they really needed to get together a search party right now and go looking for him. So the uncle contacted the leaders of the village, and they, in turn, rounded up all the able-bodied men in the village, and they all got together with headlamps and flashlights and machetes and knives, and then all together, they began walking away from the village into the jungle in the direction of this palm grove, which was the place that Akbar had been last. And so this big group of men, they get inside the jungle, and they begin walking along this path, 
which was the most likely path that Akbar would have taken to go to the palm grove and also to return from the palm grove. And as they're walking, you know, the sun is starting to set, it's getting dark, and the animals in the jungle, they're all making noises and kind of yelling at this group as they're moving through. And this group, they're shining their light around looking for any sign of Akbar, but there wasn't any. They were calling his name out, there was no response. And then at some point, as they got closer to the palm grove, they noticed there were a couple of bright red fruits, palm fruits, that had clearly been recently harvested that were scattered on the trail. And so the group began to fan out in this area, thinking that, oh my goodness, Akbar must be somewhere nearby. You know, maybe there was some sort of accident and he's fallen somewhere, or just something's happened to him, but he's got to be in this area. And so the group began fanning out off the trail, kind of hacking their way through all the underbrush. And then suddenly, one of the men, after he hacked through a particularly dense stretch of the jungle, he looked down and saw something and began to scream, and he raised his machete and began running forward. As far as we can tell, this is what happened to Akbar. The previous night, after Akbar had decided, you know, it wasn't safe to be in the jungle at night, he needed to leave, and so he gathered up all of his things and he began walking along that path where the search party would find all that fruit scattered on the trail. And so he's walking along this path and he thinks he's alone, he thinks he's okay, but in reality, he wasn't. He was being watched and followed very closely from something up in the trees. And so as Akbar moved along, this thing was kind of trailing him and seeing what he was going to do. And then at some point, this thing up in the trees began moving its way down closer and closer to Akbar. It was a 23-foot-long reticulated python. It was a massive snake. And this snake came down and launched an attack on Akbar, grabbing the back of his neck with its powerful jaws. And as soon as the snake clamped down on Akbar's neck, he let out a stifled scream, which was the scream that had woken up that other neighbor who sat up in bed wondering what that was. That was Akbar screaming out. But that was the only sound Akbar could make, because immediately the snake wrapped itself all around Akbar and squeezed him tight. And after crushing Akbar, breaking almost every bone in his body, the snake relaxed and then slithered off of Akbar. And so Akbar fell to the ground and was either dead or very close to death. And at this point, the snake opened up its jaws and positioned itself right in front of Akbar's head. And then it began kind of slithering itself forward, consuming Akbar head first. And the way pythons do this is they don't really chew on their victim. Instead, they kind of put their mouth over the top of whatever they're going to consume, and they kind of undulate and walk their bodies forward, driving the victim deeper and deeper into their body until they are completely consumed. And so the next night, when one of the members of the search party had gone off the trail and began hacking away and then saw something and charged after it with his machete, what he was seeing was the python who very clearly had a person inside of its stomach. You could see the outline of the person. And so this search party member ran forward and hacked the snake, opened it up, and there was Akbar fully dressed and deceased inside of the snake. The next and final story of today's episode is called The Popelik Monster. While she was in high school in Dayton, Ohio, Raquel Bain became known as a bit of a thrill seeker, primarily because she would do something called car surfing, which is exactly what it sounds like. She would climb on to the exterior of cars and hold on to the roof while somebody else drove it around. In addition to seeking out these physical thrills, Raquel was also drawn to psychological ones, like going to places that were supposedly haunted and seeing if she could spook herself. Following high school, Raquel kind of calmed down and became less of the wild teenager she was known for being, and instead she really focused on building a life and a career for herself. And so she would go to college, and she would earn her degree in surgical technologies, and then by 2009, she was employed full-time as a surgical assistant in Dayton. Also around that time, she had her first child, a son, who she adored. 
But despite creating this life full of stereotypically adult, mature things, like having a career and starting a family, deep down, Raquel was still very much the thrill-seeking wild teenager she was back in high school. But as an adult, she just never had time to go seek out those thrills. So, with that in mind, fast forward to April of 2016. By this point, Raquel is 26 years old. And that month, a very rare weekend popped up where Raquel did not have to work and she didn't have any childcare responsibilities. And so wanting to take advantage of this free time, Raquel asked her boyfriend, 41-year-old David Nee, if he would join her on a road trip that weekend to Louisville, Kentucky, where Raquel wanted to check out the infamously scary Waverly Hills Sanatorium. Back in the 1900s, Waverly Hills was a place where tuberculosis patients were sent. Tuberculosis, or TB for short, is an infection of the lungs and it can be deadly. Today, there's a cure for it, but back in the early 1900s, there wasn't. And so most of the people who went to Waverly Hills died there, and usually very slowly and painfully, and in total isolation from their families, because in virtue of being sent to Waverly Hills, they were effectively being quarantined to stop the spread of the disease. Waverly Hills would eventually shut down permanently in 1961, because by that point the cure had been found, and after it shut down, the building basically just sat there. Nobody else came in and turned it into anything else. And so this building is basically abandoned, and lots of people began sneaking in to see what it was like in there, and a shocking number of these trespassers reported seeing ghosts inside. Today, the sanatorium is still very much in the same condition it was left in, but the Waverly Hills Historical Society has stepped in and made it very hard for people to sneak into the building. However, knowing people do want to go in and look around, the Historical Society has begun offering guided tours of the sanatorium, and these tours are given exclusively at night to increase the spooky effect. And so David, who had only been dating Raquel for a month when she asked him to come with her to the sanatorium, he was not really that keen on doing this. It did not really appeal to him to go walking around this totally terrifying place. But he could tell it was important to Raquel, she was really excited about it, and so he agreed to go. A few days later, on the late afternoon of April 23rd, the new couple left Raquel's place, they climbed into the car, and they began driving south. Three hours later, they arrived in Louisville, and they stopped to get dinner, and then after they were done eating, they looked at the time and realized it was only about 6.45 p.m., and the tour they had scheduled at the sanatorium was not until 10 p.m., so they had a few hours to kill. And before David could suggest anything, Raquel already had the perfect idea of how they should kill this time. She told David that earlier that day, she had learned about a spot just outside of Louisville that might actually be more terrifying than the sanatorium they had come all this way to see. And so Raquel wanted to spend these few hours checking out this new spooky spot. This spooky spot was a rickety old, narrow, abandoned-looking bridge called the Pope Lick Trestle. It's located just east of downtown Louisville in this heavily wooded area. The bridge is about 800 feet long, and at its highest point, right in the middle of the bridge, it's about 90 to 100 feet off the ground. And this bridge connects the tops of two of the bigger rolling hills in the area. But the bridge's physical appearance has nothing to do with why it's considered so spooky. The reason the Pope Lick Trestle has become a central part of Kentucky folklore is because locals say there is a monster called the Pope Lick Monster that lives underneath the bridge. It's half goat, half man, and when anyone is near this bridge at night, this monster is supposed to come out from underneath this bridge, and then what happens next is very ambiguous. It kind of depends on who you're talking to. But generally speaking, once the Poplick monster has emerged and it sees you, you're dead. Now, how you die ranges from the monster leaping out and attacking you with an axe to the monster using some sort of mind control to lure you up onto the bridge where you leap off. David, after hearing this suggestion, was again not really that keen to go do this really terrifying sounding thing, but seeing the excitement in his girlfriend's face, 
he agreed to go. And so the two left the restaurant, they climbed back in the car, and they drove for about 15 or 20 minutes to the Pope Lick Trestle Bridge. The bridge actually passed over a relatively main road, and so the couple parked just off the side of this main road. And then once they were outside, they began looking for a pathway up this hillside to get up to the bridge. And very quickly, they found a well-worn dirt path that snaked up the side of this wooded hillside that looked very much like it would bring them up to the bridge. So with Raquel in front and David behind her, they began walking up this dirt path. And as they're walking, they start to see signs that clearly say, no trespassing. But they ignore them because they're looking at this path, thinking, okay, lots of people clearly come up here, so we've got to be okay. And so they keep on walking up this path, and they're getting closer and closer to the top of this hill, where they think it's going to connect with this bridge. And right as they're getting close, they see there's this huge chain-link fence, this eight-foot-tall chain-link fence with barbed wire across the top that extends in either direction out of view. And so the couple walks up to this fence, and there are more signs that say no trespassing, private property, and there are additional warning signs saying that what is on the other side of this fence is also just plain dangerous, so turn around and leave. But as Raquel and David are staring at all these signs and this fence, they see, not far from the path, somebody had clearly bent two of the fence posts and created a narrow gap in the fence that you could slip through. And so from David and Raquel's perspective, that looked like the way other trespassers must have found their way up to the bridge, and so it must be safe. And so once again, the couple disregarded all the warnings, they made their way over to this gap in the fence, they both slipped through, and they kept on walking up the hill. Just a couple of minutes later, they reached this clearing, which was at the top of this hill, and once they were in this clearing, they were able to turn, and they could actually see the bridge. It was only a couple hundred feet away from them. And it was totally intimidating. By this point, it's totally dark out, and from their perspective, all they see is this very narrow bridge that they know is 100 feet off the ground at certain points, and they can see there's no guardrails on either side of this bridge. It would have almost looked like a tightrope kind of extending off into the darkness. But even if the couple was really intimidated by the sight of this bridge and with all these warning signs before it, they were able to put their fear aside and just keep on going. And so with David now in the lead and Raquel behind him, they walked the couple of hundred feet over to the start of this narrow bridge. And when they got there, without actually stepping onto the bridge, David came to a stop. He turned around to face Raquel and he gestured for her to come stand next to him so they could take a selfie with the bridge in the background. Because David at this point is thinking, we're not going to go on this bridge. We're just going to look at this bridge, take some pictures, and then we'll go. But Raquel, who he's looking at, gesturing to come stand with him, just walks right past him onto the bridge and takes several steps out onto this narrow, rickety old thing. And then she stops, turns around, and gestures for David to come with her and walk across the entire bridge. And David, again, is having his second thoughts, but he sees Raquel wants to do this, and so he agrees to go. After they had walked about 100, maybe 200 feet across this bridge, the two of them just started laughing because it was totally exhilarating what they were doing. Not so much the quest for the pope -like monster, but rather the very real risk they were taking walking this tightrope bridge in the middle of the night. The couple would continue to very cautiously but quickly make their way across this bridge, and when they reached about the halfway point, when they were at the highest point from the ground, the bridge itself begins to shake. 
And then from behind them, they hear this loud grinding sound. And so the couple, they whip their heads around and they see there are these two bright glowing lights that are looking right at them all the way on the start of the bridge. And they realize it's a train. When Raquel and David walked up that dirt path and snuck through the fence and reached the top of the hill and could actually see the Pope Lick Trestle Bridge, they would have also seen the train tracks in the hillside that clearly extended onto the Pope Lick Trestle and went across the bridge. This was a train bridge. They would have seen that. But it's assumed that the couple, who didn't live in the area and so didn't know much about the Pope Lick Trestle, it's assumed they thought, well, you know, this is a train bridge, but it's got to be abandoned. It certainly looks abandoned, and it does. It looks totally old. It does not look active, even though it is. Or the couple thought, well, this is just an old train bridge. It might be active, but surely no train is going to come through anytime soon. We can get across the bridge before a train arrives. But, of course, they were wrong. When the couple turned around and saw these two headlights bearing down on them, they quickly realized they would not be able to outrun this train. The train's clearly trying to stop. It has seen them. It's hitting its brakes. It's sounding its horn. But it's just clearly moving too quickly. So they cannot run to the other side to safety. And because this bridge was meant for a single train to pass through, there was no other track they could just jump onto to avoid being hit. And there were no walkways on either side of this railway. And so literally all they had was the track that this train was going to cross over and they were on it. And so with no other choices, David yells to Raquel that they have to climb down and hang off the side of this bridge. Now there were these wooden slats that ran underneath the rails. They ran perpendicular to the rails. And these wooden slats kind of extended off the edge of the bridge on either side, just a couple of inches. And so in theory, if you were holding onto the outside of one of these wooden slats and kind of dangling off the edge of the bridge, a train could cross those tracks and not run over your hands or fingers. You would just have to hold on that whole time as the train is rumbling through. And so David, he flops down onto his stomach and he's trying to lower himself as fast as he can as this train is getting closer and closer. And he's yelling for Raquel to do the same thing, but she's not really moving very quickly. And finally, David, he gets in position. He's hanging off the edge of this bridge on these wooden slats and he sees Raquel. She's not quite there. And then the train comes flying through. It strikes Raquel and sends her flying off the bridge to the ground below. David would somehow manage to hold on the whole time as this train went past him. And then once the train had passed him, he pulled himself back up onto the tracks. He ran the rest of the way across the bridge. He went down that hillside. And when he found Raquel, it was immediately apparent that she was deceased. In the end, the railroad was not issued any citations or sued for negligence. It was determined they did their due diligence by setting up that eight-foot-tall barbed wire fence with all those signs telling people to stay back and warning people about the hazards of going past this fence. It was actually David who got in trouble for this tragedy. He was cited and charged with a felony of unlawfully disrupting and or delaying a train causing financial damages. He would plead to a lesser charge of trespassing and would be fined $2,300. Shockingly, this tragedy is just one of many that have occurred on the Pope Lick Trestle Bridge. Since the bridge's construction in the 1800s, there have been dozens of people who have died on this bridge. And several of these deaths, many of them fairly recent, the last 20 or so years, have occurred under the same conditions as Raquel's. People went looking for the Pope Lick monster and then were struck by a train. 